Welcome back. There's one loose end from the last presentation that needs to be tied up, one hanging chat that needs to be punched out. You'll recall that we developed the formula for uh, the total wave due to two progressive waves traveling in the same direction with the same amplitude, frequency, and wavelength. This was for one-dimensional interference. And we arrived at this function, which is clearly a progressive wave traveling to the right that has an amplitude depending on a number of things. Lowercase a was the amplitude of each individual wave. Delta x is what we call the path length difference. Lambda, of course, is the wavelength. And this is the so-called inherent phase difference, which is any difference in phase uh, in time. So if the two speakers, for instance, were oscillating out of phase in time, that's what this symbol represented. Let's use this to do a, a sample problem. So here I've separated the amplitude, and this might be worth memorizing, especially the argument here of the cosine function, because later, when we look at the interference between light waves, for instance, uh, two coherent waves coming from a single laser source, and we talk about interference patterns, we are going to see this again. And this is the overall phase difference. Remember, there's no subscript zero here. So that tells us that we're talking about the overall or total phase difference. It's got two contributions, one from the path length difference and one from the inherent phase difference. Okay, here's the example. Two equal power speakers. I didn't want to say identical speakers because identical sources means no inherent phase difference, at least in our book. They're facing the same direction, which means the listener Here's the, uh, the sound waves from both speakers overlapped, and they're being driven to produce a tone of 1200 hertz, well within the range of human hearing. And if you're standing in front of the speakers, you hear a sound level of 65 decibels. Then you're told that one of the speakers is pushed backwards. I guess that would be this one in the picture, until the sound level is only 59 decibels. And you'll notice I'm suggesting that you disregard the fact that in real life, this, the uh, sound level will drop off with distance. So as you, if you're standing over here in front of the two speakers, as you push one of them back, of course the sound's gonna get just a tad bit quieter, but that difference will be very small compared to the difference due to interference. So just forget about the fact that uh, a source that's farther away has, has a less intense sound. Where do we start? Well, since we know the frequency and we know that these are sound waves, that means we also know roughly the speed at which they travel, we can probably find the wavelength. So if there's no information given about the temperature, you just assume that you're talking about room temperature. You probably wouldn't be listening to these speakers outdoors at zero degrees Celsius. So we'll go with the usual value of 343 divided by 1200. I'm using here the fundamental relation for waves. It's the relationship between frequency, speed, wavelength, and I find 28 centimeters so you know hold your your arms out uh, at shoulder width and then bring your hands closer together something like that well they've given us the sound level in decibels so let's see here we're talking about wave interference uh, we know how to calculate the amplitude of the total wave we can relate amplitude to intensity so we need to turn the sound level in decibels into an intensity Here's the definition of the sound level in decibels. Well, we've really got two decibel levels that we're talking about. We start at 65, we drop down to 59. So the difference in two sound levels, you would just evaluate this expression for two different intensities. And then we use that rule. The difference of two logarithms is the logarithm of the quotient. You can review that. I've put the end result here that the change in the decibel level depends on the logarithm of the ratio of the intensities. And I would like to isolate the intensities. So I need to undo the logarithmic function. And that's what I've done here. The typesetting is not great. This says 10 to the delta beta over 10. I've got the difference in the sound levels. I've divided by the 10 scale factor out front. And then I raise 10 to that power. So all I really did was over here, I first divided by 10. That gives me delta beta over 10 on the left side. And then I exponentiate or take the anti-log 
of both sides. That means 10 to the power of left side, 10 to the power of the right side. Okay. Well, the change in this in the decibel level, we went from 65 down to 59. So that's a change in uh, best, uh, decibel. That's a change in decibel level of negative six, but then don't forget to divide by 10. So the power here is really negative 0 0.6. Punch that into your calculator. And I find that the ratio of the intensities is one fourth. So now that the speaker has been pushed back a ways and we don't know what that distance is, that's what we're trying to find out. The sound intensity has drastically dropped down to one fourth. And there's a little rule that you may have read in your book. The way the, the base 10 decibel system works is every drop of three decibels corresponds to cutting the intensity in half. Let me repeat that. A drop of three decibels means half the intensity. Well, if you were to drop the sound decibel level by six decibels from 65 to 62, and then from 62 to 59, then you would cut the intensity in half twice. So this number makes sense. Now, what do we do with the intensities? Here's something I did not present precisely in the previous presentation. Your book does talk about this. As a general rule for waves, the intensity, that's the rate at which power is flowing per, per unit uh, square meter, for instance, depends on the square of the amplitude. Now, this is a little imprecise because we've, we've looked at the one-dimensional treatment of interference between two waves. And intensity really has units of watts per square meter, which requires looking at things in at least two-dimensional space. So this is kind of an imprecise analysis, but we do know that intensity depends on the square of the amplitude, and we know how to calculate the amplitude for, um, for two overlapping sources in one dimension. You know, the two progressive waves traveling in the same direction. So if this is true, if intensity is proportional to the square of the amplitude, then the ratio of the two intensities should equal the ratio of the squares of the amplitude. So this is the amplitude in situation two squared. This is the amplitude in the first situation squared. The picture here is showing the second situation. That's after one of the speakers has been pushed backwards. So now that we've determined how the new intensity compares to the old, and, and that was just translating decibels into SI units, we can now uh, determine the relation between the amplitudes. So let's solve this for A2. You'll see where this is going. Solving for A2 requires taking the square root and now we can plug in numbers, or can we? We can at least plug in the ratio of the intensities. And you'll notice, um, well, we could, if we wanted, find the intensity, right? We could go back to the definition of the decibel level and find the intensity in watts per square meter, but we don't really need that right now. What I'm interested in is the ratio of the intensities, which we've already calculated. So you plug that number in, the square root of one fourth is one half, so this tells us the, that the amplitude, the total amplitude over here, that's the result of combining the two waves, is now half of what it was when the speakers were in the same position. So let's just walk through that again conceptually. We've scooted one of the speakers back. There's now some interference that results in a total wave with half the amplitude. Well, intensity depends on the square of the amplitude. And intensity is what we experience as volume, sound volume. So half the amplitude would mean one-fourth the intensity. Everything uh, is consistent so far. Here's where we use the relation that we developed with all that nasty trigonometry in the, in the previous presentation. We know that the amplitude depends on, and this when I say amplitude, currently I'm talking about the total amplitude of the wave, you know, the, the wave that results from the interference between these two individual waves. It depends on that, but that's not changing, right? We're not given what that number is. We're not told what the amplitude of the sound coming out of the speaker is, but we can assume that just scooting one of the speakers doesn't change that. So really, the decrease in amplitude is because of this cosine function. It's because the total phase difference between these sources has changed. The overall phase uh, difference between the waves has changed because of their, the change in their relative position. Okay, so here's what I'm arguing. 
by scooting the, the speaker back, we've changed delta phi to uh, make the cosine have an, a value of one half. The idea is previously the, the value of the cosine was one. That's the, the output of the cosine function. And how do I know that? Well, there's no mention here of any inherent phase difference. In fact, I was careful to say that they're driven by the same frequency generator. So when you calculate the overall phase difference for scenario one, when the speakers are in the same place, there's no delta phi sub zero because they're in phase in time. And because they're in the same place, we don't have to worry about any, <coughs> excuse me, any phase difference because of a path length difference. So the total delta phi originally is zero. And we know that the cosine of zero is one. Okay, so the only way for that amplitude to drop down to half of its original value is if this cosine function now has a value of one half. Well, you probably know, some of you, which angle has a cosine of one half. I know that the sine of 30 is one half, and that means that the cosine of 60 is one half. So what angle has a cosine of one half? That would be 60. So we're really just taking the arc cosine of both sides. Now, I just used degrees, but you have to use radians here. It must be radians. Uh, this quantity, delta phi, the safe side is, uh, or the safe thing to do is always uh, default to using radians. So let's take the arc cosine of both sides. And you can see that after we do that, we would have delta phi over two. So you'd have to multiply by two to get delta phi by itself. And there it is. The overall phase difference between these two speakers is 2.09, which is not zero, and it's not two pi, and it's not four pi, et cetera. If the overall phase difference between the waves was zero, two pi, four pi, et cetera, then, uh, then the sound should be just as loud as it was originally. But they are out of phase to some extent. So here's what you do according to the formula. You first compare the path length difference to the wavelength, and then you just multiply that fra uh, fraction times 2 pi, and then you have to add any contribution from the inherent phase difference. Well, in this case, we've already agreed there is no inherent phase difference. They're being driven by the same speaker, so we get rid of that, and then we just plug in numbers. Simple as that. I've solved this equation now for delta x. So the the phase difference of 2.09, if you compare that to 2 pi, and 2 pi, you can do that in your head, right? Isn't pi close to the integer 3, 3.14, etc., is close to 3, so 2 pi is close to 6. So our, uh, let's see here, yeah, we've already calculated the wavelength. So since the overall phase difference, which is due only to the path length difference, is about one-third of two pi radians, then evidently they've been spaced apart, the speakers have been spaced apart by about one-third of a wavelength. So instead of 28 centimeters, we find that the speakers are nine centimeters apart. You can almost do some of this in your head, maybe not you know, divide the numbers in your head, but if, if you know that the total phase difference is due only to their path length difference, and if you determine that that phase difference is Let's say the phase difference come down, or came out to be pi. Well, pi is half of 2 pi. And that tells you that the path length difference would be half of a wavelength. It's as simple as that. You just take what, you know, whatever your phase difference is compared to 2 pi, you take that fraction of a wavelength, and that's your path length difference. Okay, that's it for that example. Moving on. Here's a topic that was introduced earlier in your book, super important for this semester. We're going to use it when we talk about the interference of light waves. Although the proper context in which to introduce the index of refraction would probably be electricity and magnetism. So you may have encountered this in your class on E&M. Index of refraction, there's a couple uh, there's a couple ways to define it. I suppose it really just tells you how fast a wave travels in a medium. It's a comparison of the speed of the wave in a medium to the speed of the, the wave in vacuum. And when I say the wave, I'm talking specifically now about light waves. So we're shifting now, shifting our, our frame of mind here from sound waves to light waves. 
And we have not yet talked really about what's waving in an electromagnetic wave. That's a topic for a future chapter. So we'll have a lot more to say about that. The details don't even concern us at this point. It doesn't really matter what's waving because the important concepts are wavelength, frequency, wave number. We've already introduced those things. So we don't have to sweat right now about what exactly is waving. Here's an awesome GIF that I found on Quora. I had to write this guy's name down because I thought it was so cool. I don't know this person, Tipper Rumpf. I wish my name was that cool. And I'm not sure what this green bar is showing us, but we don't need that anyway. So what can we observe? Here's a wave which is clearly traveling faster in the left medium than it is in the right medium. So it's slowed down as soon as it goes from medium one to medium two. And that means that the wavelength has gotten shorter. Now, maybe this is what they're trying to show us. Look at the, the green dot on the right and watch how often it goes up and down, up and down. Doesn't that dot rise and fall just as quickly in time as the dot on the left? They're both wiggling up and down or oscillating with the same frequency. So as a general rule, and there are some exceptions, I'm sure, you don't have to worry about the frequency changing as light goes from one side to the other. Just go back to the analogy of a rope. If you had a rope, uh, let's say a lightweight rope, and you were shaking one end of that rope, but at the other end it was, it was attached or like glued to a heavier rope, once the wave gets to the heavier rope, like here let's say, it's still going to shake up and down at the same rate at which you're shaking the lightweight end. So that doesn't change. The driving frequency is what determines the frequency of both, both sides of the wave. What will change is the wavelength. And if you look carefully at this particular example, doesn't it look like the wavelength on the left is about three times the wavelength on the right? Peak to peak distance here is three times peak to peak distance here. And it's no coincidence that this index here, this letter N in medium two is, has the value three, and over here, the index has the value one. All right, so before I make that statement mathematically, let's remind ourselves that the wavelength is determined by speed and frequency. Okay, now, I just pointed out that the frequency doesn't change, but the wavelength clearly does. So look at this formula. What has to change in order for lambda to go down if the frequency is not changing? Obviously, it's the numerator. If the wavelength is now shorter, but the frequency doesn't change, then the wave speed has to be lower. Okay, so slower wave, shorter wavelength. It's just go back to the, the rope example. When you shake the rope repeatedly, if the ripples travel slower, then they don't go as far in between shakes. So the wavelength is shorter. Okay, so speed two is less than speed one in this picture. And then, Let's assume that the medium, quote, medium on the left is really no medium at all. Let's just say it's vacuum. Now, it turns out for air, this quantity N is really, really close to one anyway. So it's air or vacuum. And if it really is a vacuum, we have a special word or letter, I should say, a special letter for that speed, C, the universal constant, also known as the speed of light, which is a little misleading because it's really also the speed of radio waves. It's the speed of x-rays, speed of ultraviolet, speed of gravitational waves, maximum speed of information travel. Okay. Just a moment ago, I made this observation in words. The, uh, the index here has a value of three and one has a value of one. That ratio three to one happens to be the same as the ratio of the wavelengths, but in the reverse order. So it's the left wavelength that's three times as great as the right wavelength. So if you're wondering what the heck N is, you could just say that the ratio of the, the indices of refraction, that's the letter N, the ratio of those indexes is the same as the ratio of the wavelengths. Really, it's the reciprocal. So that's one way of, of just thinking about it. You know, if you could actually measure the wavelength in light, excuse me, the wavelength of light in various mediums, media, then you could define these index indices of refraction in terms of 
the, the various wavelengths. So the ratio of the n values or the indexes of refraction would be equal to the ratio of the wavelengths. Okay, well, let's use this formula here to substitute for lambda. So instead of lambda 1, I'm going to call it v1 over f. That's just the fundamental relation for waves. Same thing downstairs. You'll notice I don't have f1 and f2 because the frequency doesn't change. That means frequency cancels. And here's another way to think about the index of refraction. The ratio of the indices of refraction for two different media, that ratio is equal to the reciprocal ratio of the speeds. So clearly, index of refraction tells you something about the speed of light in the medium. What have I done here? Okay, since I'm assuming that this is vacuum over here, then this speed V1, we can really just call it C. So let me replace V1 with the symbol C. And then, since N1 happens to, to be uh, 1.0, and that's kind of a by convention thing, we just define the in index of refraction of vacuum to be one. So down here in the denominator, I'll replace N1 with the number one. And lastly, we're gonna solve for one of these. I forget which. Aha, we'll solve for the speed. The speed of the, the wave in the material. Evidently, what you do to calculate the speed of light in a material is to take the speed of light in vacuum and divide by the index of refraction. There it is. And you might imagine that if anything, the light will go slower in the material. It's not going to speed up. There may be an exception to that, but that's, that's beyond the scope of this class. So for the vast majority of cases, the wave should go slower in the material. And that tells us that this index has to be greater than one, right? If n was less than one, then we would actually be scaling the speed up above the speed of light. So this you need to memorize. Sure, throw it on your note card, but it would be better to just have it memorized. And what I've done here is dispense with the subscript because rather than being specific to this diagram, let's just know in general, the speed of electromagnetic waves in a material can be calculated as the speed of light divided by n. And I'd like to point out right now that this index n actually depends on the wavelength in vacuum. So over here in the picture, this wavelength has a particular value and the curve is colored blue. Let's just call it blue light. Well, what if we were talking about red light, which would have a longer wavelength? Depending on the medium we're looking at, the speed may actually change. So the speed of a wave, of a light wave through a material may actually depend to some extent on the wavelength. And that would imply that the index of refraction also depends on wavelength. Now we're not gonna be troubled by that usually in this class, but it's worth keeping in mind that index of refraction is frequency dependent, or you could say wavelength dependent. And that, that matters a lot for some phenomena. One of the things I hope to find time to look at this semester is rainbows. It would be nice to do a detailed explanation of how rainbows work using the ray optics that we'll look at later in the semester. And in order to stand, uh, excuse me, in order to understand rainbows, you have to accommodate for the fact that the index of refraction is a function of wavelength. Okay, let's write down one more formula. I've got the, the relationship between the wavelength ratio and the index of refraction ratio. Let's solve this for lambda 2. That's the wavelength over here. You get this. And if the left medium is a vacuum, then we replace N1 with the number 1. And then we can replace lambda 1 with the symbol lambda vacuum. Right? And now, evidently, I've replaced the subscript 2 with medium. So this is the variable meaning medium we're talking about. Maybe this is glass, water, oil, but the other medium is vacuum. And you'll notice I've gotten rid of the subscript 2 as well. So this n with no subscript means the wavelength in the medium. So it's very easy to relate, I'm sorry, not the wavelength, the index of refraction. N is the index of refraction of this medium. It's very easy to calculate the wavelength of light in a medium if you happen to know the medium's index of refraction. All you do is take the vacuum wavelength and divide it down 
by the index of a fraction. This is another way to remember that the index of a fraction tends to be greater than one because we know that usually the wavelength in the medium is shorter than the vacuum wavelength. So we have to be dividing by something greater than one. Need to memorize that. That's why I put the, the magic blue box around it, okay? I would try to memorize both of those. That'll save you some time. Instead of flipping around in your book or Googling, you'll just know it. You could also turn this inside out, and this is a nice way to think about index of a fraction. It's the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in the material. And since light in vacuum is almost always faster than uh, the speed in the material, this number is almost always greater than one. Why am I saying almost always? Well, I'm vaguely aware of some very exotic exceptions. Now, I stand by my assertion earlier that you can't send information faster than light or energy faster than light, but there are circumstances in which a wave can travel faster. So maybe that's something you'll encounter in the future. Furthermore, sometimes this number takes on negative values. What? Negative values? If n was negative, well, c is not a negative number. Does that mean that the speed is negative? Mm, no. You see, index of a fraction is going to come up in another context later in the semester when we talk about Snell's law and the bending of light. So a negative index of a fraction means that the light bends the, the opposite direction from what you would normally expect. We'll come back to that. So as far as you're concerned right now, n always greater than 1, unless you're talking about vacuum. Here's a table of some indices of refraction. You can Google these and find all kinds of tables. And typically, if a material even has an index of refraction, it's a transparent medium, or at least uh, partially translucent. You have to be able to pass light through it. Um, you know, what does it mean to, to talk about the index of a fraction of like solid iron? Can you shine light through iron? Well, not visible light. However, it, it actually is meaningful to define an in index of a fraction for a conductor. It ends up being a complex number. It's got a real part and an imaginary part. And the real part tells you how far the, the wave will penetrate into the conductor. We don't have to worry about that in this class. So for our purposes, n is a real number. It's greater than 1. Let's check out the relation between the speeds and the indexes. Notice, as we go down, down the list, we get to materials for which light travels slower and slower. So instead of uh, 300 million meters per second, here we've got 125 million meters per second. So do you see that the lower the speed in the medium, the higher the index of a fraction? That's a relationship you should memorize. A uh, material with a higher index of refraction slows light down even more. Evidently, diamond is really good at slowing light down. And we'll see later in the semester that uh, the better a material is at slowing light down, the better it is at bending light. So the bending of the light is what gives diamond its characteristic sparkle because not only is it bending the colors, it's bending the colors by different amounts. I said a moment ago that index of refraction depends on wavelength. Well, that's why diamonds look so cool. Okay, quick graphic showing you that glass can, in fact, bend light. And the fact that it's bending is a consequence of the fact that it's traveling more slowly in the glass. And you might be wondering, why would the ray turn just because it's traveling more slowly? You really can't understand that. It can't understand that without looking at the wave nature of light. So later in the semester, we'll use the wave model to make it very believable that waves should turn or refract as they enter a medium where the speed changes. So like I said, I pulled this off Wikipedia, but there are some exotic, quote, meta, meta materials out there that have very strange be behavior when it comes to light. They can make light bend the opposite direction from what you might expect. Like, um, look at the ray coming here. It bends. If you're going in the direction of the ray, it bends to the left. Well, people have developed, developed materials that would make light bend the opposite direction. And that's where that negative index of refraction comes from. Here we are back at the Falstad Ripple Tank. It's just good for so many things. 
and I've got the preset labeled refraction. You can see that there's a source of waves. It's actually a, a line source. Instead of a single point source of waves, there's a whole sequence of point sources. And the behavior I just mentioned is being demonstrated here. You can see that those ripples bend, or they change direction as the wave travels from one medium to the next. So these two different colors signify two different indices of refraction. So I've not seen the source code. I'm not sure I would understand it anyway, but whoever programmed this, Falstad or one of his buddies, uh, was obviously using the mathematics of interference that we're looking at uh, in two dimensions. <clears throat> now, I'm not really interested in the, the bending behavior at the moment. What I'd like to look at is a different behavior so let me change the orientation of this line source and I'll put it up here and let me actually stretch it out so this looks more like a plane wave. That's something we need to talk more about, plane waves. Okay, I'll clear the waves and observe what happens when this wave reaches the interface. See these reflected waves? So in addition to some of the energy being transmitted into the second medium, a portion of the original energy was reflected. And that's a general wave phenomenon. When a discontinuity is encountered, in this case it's a discontinuity in the index of refraction. If you were talking about waves on a string, the discontinuity could be where a heavier string is joined to a lighter string. So when a wave encounters a discontinuity, there tends to be a reflection and a transmission. And the relative proportions will depend on the physics of that particular uh, type of wave. Like I've mentioned before, if you're talking about light waves, in almost every circumstance, you're going to go back to Maxwell's equations. Those are really the, the equations that govern the behavior of the electric and magnetic fields. So let's check that out one more time. And you know what, maybe I should switch color schemes. I haven't shown you this yet. I like this one. observe the reflection and transmission. They both happen. Uh, now what happens to the, the proportions in a reflection versus transmission if we change the frequency? Let's see if that has any effect on how much of the energy is reflected. Now we've got a higher frequency wave Okay, not a huge difference. It looks like maybe in this instance there's more energy reflected. Here's another FET simulation that actually makes that behavior more obvious because it's highlighted in the programming here. We've got a source of light waves. Right now they're being, um, they're being represented by rays. When we get to the chapter on ray optics, obviously we're going to regard light as, well, we're going to describe light with rays and talk about reflection and refraction. Right now, we're more interested in the wave behavior. So here's, again, this is just pictorial. This is a cartoon picture of light as a wave. But there's a number of things going on here. First, you see that the light reflects, and it's easy to see that it's reflected at the same, same angle at which it's incident, but it's also refracted into the medium. So this incoming energy goes to two places. It goes, or it's transmitted into the next medium, but some of it is also reflected. And I'm not sure how they chose the thickness of the, the bars here. It seems a little misleading. If anything, I would make the reflected beam and the transmitted beam or refracted beam add up to the original beam in width. So I'm not sure why they chose those widths, but watch what happens to both the angle of the bending and the amount that's reflected if I change the frequency. Uh, where do I do that? Where's the slider for frequency? I don't see it. Okay, so fine. Instead, what I'll, what I'll do is change the index of refraction of this material. Not this first material, but this material here. See how it says water 1.33? That's a number worth memorizing because it comes up often. The index of refraction of water is about 1.33. Now that's one and a third, which is four thirds. Take the reciprocal, that tells you that light travels about three quarters as fast in water as it does in vacuum. So 
light slows down by about 25% in water. Okay. So I'm moving the index of refraction around. I see two things changing. The angle at which it bends changes. That's a topic for later in the semester. But look what happens to the brightness of this reflected beam. It practically disappears here, and then it gets darker. So the percentage of the energy that's reflected depends on the relationship between these indices of reflection. Fraction. I almost said reflection, but there's no index of reflection. Index of refraction. That's worth remembering that the amount of light that's reflected versus transmitted depends on index of refraction. The amount that's reflected versus transmitted also depends on the angle of incidence. This angle here is the angle of incidence. Let me make that angle approach zero. Was there any difference in, in the brightness of this reflected beam? Yeah. Darker here, lighter here. Now the case that we're looking at in this chapter is always normal incidence. This is called normal incidence. So the incoming beam is perpendicular or normal to the boundary between the two media or the interface. In other words, the angle of incidence is zero. And you're really already familiar with the fact that light reflects from a boundary between two media because you know that you can see yourself, you can see your reflection in a storefront window. So how does that work? Well, the sun's light gets scattered by the sky or the atmosphere. Some of that light bounces off your body and then it strikes the window. Now, somebody inside this window or inside the building could obviously see you through the window. That means most of the light coming off your body is transmitted through the glass, but the fact that you can see yourself in the glass while standing outside tells you that some of the light is reflected off the glass. And I think the number is for normal incidents, something like 4% of the incident light will reflect off of regular glass. You've already seen this, but I'd like to remind you about the boundary conditions for waves, transverse waves on something like a string, or in this case, it's a slinky. You can just watch, that's the best way to see it. Are you picking up on what's happening here? When there's a reflection at a fixed end, you also get inversion. When the other end of the slinky is fixed, then the reflected pulse is inverted. It's flipped the other way around. And same thing at his, his hands, because his hands fix the other end, there's an inversion. But when the opposite end is loose, the reflected pulse is not inverted. So there's two things going on here. There's the reflection, but there's also the possible inversion. I showed you that so that you would have a picture in your head that helps you conceptualize an analogous behavior for light waves. So instead of talking about pulses on strings being reflected and possibly inverted at a boundary, now we're talking about electromagnetic waves. And the thing that's waving, that's the electric and magnetic fields. We'll look at that more later. So here's an incident wave on a boundary between two mediums and the index of refraction for this green medium, I'll call it N2. And if N2 is greater than N1, it can be shown using Maxwell's equations that the incident light will experience a, a reflection and transmission and that the reflected wave will suffer an inversion, just like the boundary condition for a, a string with one end fixed or a slinky. A fixed end for a slinky produces an inversion. Well, when light passes into, an, into a medium with a higher index of refraction, there is also an inversion like this. Okay, so the incident wave is still going in. Now I didn't show the transmitted wave. All I showed was the incident 
and reflected. Let's watch that again. So as soon as this peak enters the medium, what's reflected is actually a valley. You see that? There's a phase difference of pi between what the ingoing peak is doing and the outgoing valley is doing. This time I've actually, see this helps me conceptually. Um, when I try to picture a reflection, I'm going backwards now. So here's, here's me going forward in time. It kind of helps me to imagine this wave flipped over on the other side like this. So right now is when the inversion begins to happen. And you can just picture that this reflected wave is coming from like a second wave that was already waiting on the other side. It's not necessary to do that, but it helps me to think about it. Okay, but the takeaway is if the second medium has a higher index of refraction, in other words, if the wave travels slower, then uh, the reflected wave is inverted. Maybe you're thinking, how come I didn't show this with a shorter wavelength? Well, because this does not represent the wave in the medium. I'm just showing, uh, I'm imagining that this reflected wave came from somewhere else. That's probably confusing you. Just forget about this. Okay, thin film interference. You can find this in this topic in any of the books on this subject. And hopefully it doesn't ruin the mystery and beauty of something like, like an iridescent soap bubble for you or the iridescence of a puddle of oil, a thin layer of oil in the street after a rain. But we're going to explain how that works. What's the, what's the explanation for that phenomenon? Well, it's all in this word interference. The NM here is for nanometer. Nano means billionth. So these numbers clearly describe the wavelengths of light in nanometers. Here's the basic idea. I pulled these graphics off of Wikipedia. These two incoming waves, they're really part of the same light source. So the only reason they're color coded is so you can distinguish them in your mind. But the idea is both of these waves are just part of, for instance, a laser beam. So they're, they're already in phase. And you know this picture is not great because it's actually showing these out of phase. Uh, I'm surprised Wikipedia is usually better than that. So forget about the fact that this valley sort of lines up with this peak. These are supposed to be in phase already. Let's, let's say they come from the same source, at least for our purposes. So wave B reflects off the top surface of this layer of material. So if you want, think of this as air up here, air down here. And this is just a thin layer of material like the soapy water that makes a bubble or that thin layer of oil that uh, sits on top of the water in the street after it rains. That's wow, it sounded like I was about to get poetic there, but I'm just talking about science. So wave B skips off the front surface. Wave A uh, is transmitted through the top surface, but then bounces off the, or reflects off the back surface. So both of those waves end up uh, going out in the direction of C. And that means they're going to interfere. You know, they, they were superposed on the way in, then they separate for just a bit, but they're superposed on the way back out. And in this particular picture, uh, they meet back up again in a way that is such that they still interfere constructively. So I guess it's not really, they put, uh, a and B being out of phase because I guess they're more interested in the behavior after the reflection. But for our purposes, almost every problem we do, we're assuming that both of these incoming waves come from the same light source. It's a coherent light source, meaning everything has a defined phase relationship and everything's in phase. Okay, down here, you can see that the outgoing waves do not interfere constructively. The peaks and the valleys are uh, mismatched between the two waves. So. Just to be clear, you can probably see this, but the, the black and red dashed waves show the two reflected waves. The green one would be the superposed or total wave. Same down here, the green wave is the total wave. So you don't get uh, perfect destructive interference here, but uh, overall the, the, the net wave is considerably less in amplitude than what you get up here. And how come we don't get perfect destructive interference. Well, you can see that the, the valleys of the red 
wave don't exactly line up with the peaks of the black wave. If they did, you would be closer to perfect destructive interference. Okay, I won't talk about these formulas in any great detail because you already suffered through that in the last horribly tedious video. But briefly, the total or overall phase between these two waves has two contributions. Path length difference is one and inherent phase difference is another. If you want constructive interference, then the overall phase difference has, has to be an integer multiple of two pi. If you want destructive interference, it's gotta be um, a half integer multiple of two pi. Put another way, constructive interference requires an even multiple of pi, not an even multiple of two pi, an even multiple of pi. Destructive interference requires an odd multiple of pi. Odd multiple of pi is the same as a half integer multiple of two pi. Moving on, these pictures are slightly misleading for our purpose because again, we're only gonna look at light that's incident normally. So all of these angles of incidence, they've labeled them theta one, theta one. What we're looking at really is the case where theta one is equal to zero. So the, the light rays are coming straight down, but it's easier to understand what's happening in the drawing when you tilt them a little bit. Okay, so thin film interference. You could use that phrase to describe a variety of instances, really any situation in which one of the mediums has an extremely small thickness. A great example is a soap bubble. The soap bubble is a thin film of soapy water. There's air on the inside of the bubble or cigarette smoke. If you've ever seen street artists do that, that's kind of cool. You know, lung cancer and stuff, but it still looks cool. Um, and then air on the outside. Classic example of thin film interference. But I also mentioned a thin layer of oil sitting on top of water in the street after it rains. There's that poetry again. And the intentional case. So these are examples in nature or you know, kids playing with uh, bubble making machines. But what about um, in optics? Anti-reflective coatings, so binoculars telescope lenses, even casual sunglasses where you'd like to re reduce the amount of light uh, reflecting off of the, uh, the lenses. I think this is the case that we're gonna look at in a little more detail. Over here, I've got some common indices of water. I think it might be worth knowing three of these. You, you do need to know that the index for air is really close to one. Air is so rarefied, it doesn't have any significant effect on the speed of light. Uh, if you carried more digits, it would be something like 1.0003, I think. Water, 1.33, worth memorizing. For oil, it's around one and a half. And for glass, it depends on the type of glass. Some glass is 1.5, some is 1.6. I'm sure you can find glass with indices closer to two. Same thing for oil. It depends what type of oil. But order of magnitude, I guess, it's worth memorizing. A lot of materials have an index of refraction around one and a half. Now, one and a half, isn't that three halves? That tells you that the speed is two thirds the speed of light in vacuum. That's how that works. If the index of refraction is three halves, then the speed of light in that material is two thirds the speed of light in vacuum. Notice, by the way, they're using the letter lowercase d for the thickness of the thin layer, same as your book. Graphic from your book, it's clear that the top glasses have an anti-reflective coating. The lenses down here are reflecting white light, which is really the, the whole spectrum of visible light. That's not totally true. Uh, the human eyeball can be tricked into seeing white light with just red, green, and blue. If you've never done this, uh, depending on how old your computer is, you might be able to get a big magnifying glass and look at the pixels on your computer screen up close. And if the screen is white, you'll notice it's really just red, green, and blue. Other animals, maybe not so easy to trick if their eyeballs work differently. Um, modern light detectors, you can't trick them the way you can trick the human eye. Anyway, so there's a whole bunch of frequencies bouncing off of this glass. Up here, not all the visible frequencies are being reflected. This, this glass looks more bluish, which suggests that the red light is not being reflected from, from these lenses the way it is from the lenses on the bottom. If you've ever messed around with uh, more expensive uh, 
camera equipment or telescope optics, you're familiar with these colors, right? A lot of binoculars, for instance, have a purplish hue or a greenish hue, which tells you that uh, some colors are being reflected more strongly or more intensely than others. It looks like red light is not being reflected from these lenses. And if you have red, green color blindness, I guess this graphic's not doing much for you. Sorry about that. Let's see if we can explain the phenomenon of thin film interference. Okay, so we've got the incident wave approaching. Some of that incident energy is reflected, some is transmitted. And notice if the thin film has a higher index of refraction than air, which is likely because air is basically one, then there's going to be that pi uh, shift in phase. You just have to memorize that. When, when an electromagnetic wave reflects off a surface where the, the material on the other side has a higher index, in other words, if it's going to slow down as it goes into the next medium, then you get that pi shift in phase upon reflection. Then part of the wave continues on and reflects off the next boundary. Because in a, in a picture prior, I showed you some glass lenses. So you've got a very, I neglected to mention this, the manufacturer will deposit a very thin coating of some special chemical on the surface of the glass. And we're going to assume, as your book does, that the index of refraction of the glass is even higher than the index of refraction of the coating. So the values of these indices in order go air, then the coating's higher, and then glass is even higher, something like one and a half. So that means you get a second reflection here with a phase shift of pi. Now, if the glass had an index lower than the coating, there would not be a phase shift of pi. It's exactly like the string. When the string bounces off a free end, there's no inversion, okay? Both reflections involve an inversion. So these two reflected waves both experienced a phase shift of pi. And since they both experienced the same phase shift, that tells you that if they started out in phase on the way in, then they might be in phase on the way back. It depends. It depends on the additional phase shift from the path length difference. What is the path length difference? Well, like I said, this picture is a little misleading. Both waves come in along this path, then they split. Here's the first reflected wave. The second reflected wave had to travel a little further, didn't it? It had to go this extra distance into the coating and then this extra distance back. So these two hypotenuses, hypotenai, if you want to call them that, the sum of these two lengths would actually be the path length difference. This plus this is how much farther the second wave has to travel. However, we're talking merely about the case of normal incidence. So imagine this ray uh, coming in vertically on the screen here. And that means it's gonna go in vertically to the coating and bounce back vertically. So the path length difference is really just D into the coating and D back out of the coating. That's 2D, two two uh, not two dimensions, two times D, the thickness of the coating. Okay, first wave, phase shift to pi, second wave, or second reflected wave, also a phase shift. Bada bing, bada boom. Now, let's look at the first contribution to the overall phase shift, or excuse me, the overall phase difference between these two reflective, reflected waves. I'm going to put it this way. Uh, they were already in sync in time because they came in from the same source, but each one picked up a phase shift of pi. So if we if we look at the difference between their phases now, you subtract, you just get zero. You almost don't need a formula for it. Honestly, a lot of these thin film interference problems are almost better solved by thinking physically. And I'll repeat this in a moment, but you don't wanna to rely too heavy, heavily on any one formula to solve these problems. You need to know how wavelength depends on index of refraction. You need to know when there's a phase shift upon reflection, and then you just kind of reason through it from there. I would, I would just redevelop the formula in each specific problem. Do not rely too heavily on any one formula, but we will develop the formulas in the book for the specific case of 
an optical, uh, anti, it's called an anti-reflection coating, where it's assumed that N glass is greater than N coating is greater than N air. Okay, so that means the only possible phase difference between these two reflected waves would have to be the one due to the path length difference. This is an abbreviation I'm just using here in this slideshow, PLD. You don't have to use that if you don't want. So what have I done? I've taken the total path length difference, 2D, and of course that's only applicable for normal incidence. I've compared it to the wavelength in the material. That's important. Uh, it's not enough to compare it to the vacuum wavelength. If you, if you wanna know how the phase of this second wave changes as a result of passing through that material, then you need to use the wavelength in the material. That's an easy way to screw up there, forgetting that it matters which wavelength you're using. So this is the wavelength in the optical coating and whatever that fraction is, you just multiply that by two pi, that's it. Here's another way to think about that same result. So take one more look at this formula. I'm going to develop that formula again <coughs> using a slightly different thought process. Let's do this instead. Let's figure out how long it takes the second wave to traverse the coating front to back and then compare that to a period. Because if it took one period to cross the coating, isn't that like an additional phase shift of two pi? Mm. So if it takes the second wave a full period to go forward and backward across that coating, well, during that one period, it would have executed one oscillation. So, you know, it's like there's no change in phase, or you could say it's a phase, an additional phase shift of two pi radians or four pi, you know, if it took two periods to go across. So remember, uh, one period is the amount of time it takes the light to do one oscillation. Okay. so. First, let's figure out how long it takes to cross forward and backward, and then we'll compare that amount of time to one period. Well, I'm just using distance, <coughs> excuse me, distance equals speed times time. If we take the total distance that the wave has to travel, 2D, and divide it by how fast it moves in the coding, that will tell us how long it takes to cross the coding there and back. Well, the speed in the coding is the speed in vacuum divided down by the index of refraction of the coding. Remember that? So N is gonna come up top, that's what I've done here. And then I've simply chosen to call the index N instead of N coding. See the picture over here? I got rid of this subscript <coughs> instead of N coding. Let's just call it N. Now that we know how long it takes to go across and back, let's compare that to the period. So is it a quarter period, a half period? Take that fraction of two pi, again, if the amount of time, <coughs> excuse me, if the amount of time it takes to cross is equal to the period, then you would take one times two pi. That's a phase shift of two pi. If it takes uh, half a period, well, one half of two pi would be a phase shift of pi. Okay, take this expression for T, plug it in right there. What else have I done here? I'm remembering that capital T period is the reciprocal of frequency. So since I have a one over T here, I can just replace it with the frequency F. That's the frequency in Hertz. And then F and C, does that ring a bell? Remember the fundamental relationship for waves. Frequency times wavelength is wave speed. So if we move this around, what did I just do? I guess I'm asking you to do one step in your head here and recognize that F over C is the reciprocal of vacuum wavelength. Basically, yeah, replace F over C here with one over the wavelength in vacuum. Okay, let's replace F over C by the reciprocal of the wavelength in vacuum. That's what I'm doing with this formula here. And then I can recognize that the wavelength in vacuum divided by N, that's what gives you the wavelength in the material, in the coating. Lambda vac over N is lambda in the coding. So I'll make that replacement. And I think we're just about done here. That's it. I'm, I was trying to alternatively come up with the formula for the phase shift due to the path length difference by thinking in terms of how long it would take the second wave to cross that path length difference and expressing that time as a, as a fraction of the period.
and lastly, multiplying by two pi. Okay, this is the, uh, the same formula that I came up with before. However you'd like to think about it, just know how to use it. Let's now recover some formulas that were given in your book for the specific case of an anti-reflective coating where the index of the coating is less than the index of the glass. What if we would like constructive interference? And off the top of my head, I can't think of a reason why you would want that. Uh, if you were hoping to get maximum reflection off the surface, and maybe you're thinking, okay, what, what's the overall, what's going on here? Remember, in general, there's always a combination of reflection and transmission. Some of the energy is going to transmit into the second material. Some of it will reflect. And depending on what your purpose is, you may wish to increase the amount that's reflected or decrease it. So it's interesting that you have control over where the energy goes by, by changing perhaps the thickness of the coating or the material from which the coating is made. That means changing the index of refraction. So if you want reflection, then you need the phase difference, the overall phase difference between those two reflected waves to be zero or two pi or four pi. That's gonna give you the most energy coming back because if the two reflected waves are out of phase, they're going to interfere destructively. And that means less energy bouncing off the front. So don't lose sight of that fact that, you know, we're talking about peaks and valleys and interference, whether it's constructive or deconstructive, but ultimately you're determining by changing these design parameters, how much of the energy comes off versus uh, transmits through the material. Okay, well, if that's true, if, if we would like this overall phase difference, which is only due to the path length difference, if we'd like that to equal an integer multiple of two pi, then just take this expression for the total phase difference, plug it in there, and you get this, right? So the right side came or went over here, and then this left side came from that. Of course, the two pi's cancel, bye-bye. And we're solving for, what are we solving for? The thickness. If you were designing this thin film coating or you would need this anti-reflective coating, you would need to know how thick it needs to be to achieve the desired constructive interference. So solve this for D. What did I do there? Let me back up. Aha, the, the wavelength in the coating. Once again, let's invoke the, the uh, formula that relates wavelength in the coating to wavelength and vacuum. Wavelength in the coating is just the vacuum wavelength divided by N. So the N showed up in the numerator. And instead of saying a lambda vacuum, I'm just calling it lambda. So right now, lambda means the wavelength in vacuum. Solve for lambda, that means put it over here, and then the, uh, the integer m goes down here. And then lastly, I've just adopted the same notation as your book. Let's use a subscript c for constructive. This gives you the set of wavelengths that will produce constructive interference for uh, the vacuum wavelength that I'm talking about. What the formula is telling us then is that for a given thickness of coating, if you've already chosen the thickness of the coating and you've already determined the index of refraction of your material, then there's a set of wavelengths for which the two reflected waves will produce constructive interference. Now in practice, depending on the value of N and D, you may find that you only get one wavelength out of this set that actually falls within the visible spectrum. Maybe if you plug in M equals two, you get an infrared wavelength or an ultraviolet wavelength. So <clears throat> your book presents this formula for the allowable or for the set of wavelengths for which you get constructive interference between the two outgoing waves. You could also turn this inside out, I mentioned a moment ago, and solve instead for D. Like if you knew which wavelength you would like to interfere constructively, let's say you, you want to get blue light uh, reflecting strongly, then you would use the known wavelength of blue light and experiment, uh, excuse me, you would also use the, uh, the known index of refraction of your coating and tinker with these various values of M to see which uh, thickness D was required. Or maybe you had, for whatever design reason, reason you had a 
value of D in mind already. Like you only want to deposit a two micrometer thick layer of coating. Then you could experiment perhaps with different types of coatings and find which index of refraction produced uh, constructive interference for the des desired wavelength at a given uh, coating thickness. So there's, there's a variety of ways you could make a, like a homework problem out of this formula, right? Now, more often you're, you're desiring not constructive interference, but destructive interference. That's what you would call the anti-reflective coating. If you're talking about an optical instrument, like a telescope, the whole point of the telescope is to collect as much light as possible. You don't want starlight bouncing off the front of your lens necessarily. You wanna keep it all. So you would like to direct more of the power into the glass. Make sure you get as much transmission as possible and as little reflection as possible. And that means that you like you would like the two reflected waves to interfere destructively. Well, we already know that the overall phase difference needs to be a half integer multiple of two pi. And this quantity delta phi, the total phase difference, it only comes from this. We've already established the fact that there's a phase shift of pi for both reflections. So we don't have to worry about the inherent phase difference. Take this, plug it in there. We get this. What's next? Cancel the two pi's. Yep. And then let's uh, recall that the wavelength in the coating is the vacuum wavelength divided by the index of refraction of the coating. So an N pops up in the numerator. And now I'm just calling the vacuum wavelength lambda. And then what do we solve for now? Let's be consistent with the book and look at the formula for the set of wavelengths, lambda D for destructive. Plug in various integer values for M to get the set of wavelengths that will experience destructive interference for a given index for the coding and a given thickness of the coding. And again, you could flip this formula around and use it instead to solve for the required thickness of the coding based on the index of the material and based on the wavelength <laughs> that you're talking about. Now you could write this in a slightly different way. No, hang on a second. I forgot to say one thing. If you go back to the case of constructive interference, here I said M can be zero, one, two. And over here, I just wrote one, two, three. And that's because if you plug in M equals zero, you get that the wavelength is infinite. That makes no sense. So we have to throw that out. Okay, so previously it was M equals one, two, three. And your book just does this thing where they'd like to keep the formulas the same between the two. So if you want M to also take on the values one, two, three, then you can change this plus sign to a minus sign. Notice if you plug in zero, you get zero plus a half. That's not infinity overall, so that's fine. You could also write this as M minus a half and have the index start with one, two, three. But here's my advice. Here's my strong advice. Don't use these formulas as a crutch. I don't have them memorized. In fact, you know, I have to relearn this every time because they're not that important. You don't need these formulas. All you need is to understand that there's a phase shift of pi <clears throat> when there's a reflection such that the, uh, the material on the opposite side has a greater index of refraction. So if you know that, and you know that the phase difference for constructive interference needs to be two pi, four pi, six pi, et cetera. And you know that the phase difference for destructive interference needs to be pi, three pi, et cetera. You're good. You can figure the problem out just fine with those facts. Now, if you see a problem like this on an exam, you want to write, uh, you know, show your reasoning as much as possible. You can't just write down the answer. I need to see something. So maybe what you could do is develop the formula that's appropriate for that problem. That's my advice. Back to the Falstad ripple tank. And wouldn't you know, I've gone with the anti-reflective coating setting. If I click here, you can see there's the coating that's been programmed. It's a very thin layer of some material with a different index of refraction. So there are three indices of refraction here, the one up top, the one on the bottom, and then whatever's inside this coating here. And it looks to me like we're getting no reflection. I don't see any waves bouncing off the coating. All the waves are going into the uh, the trans, what is it? The transmitting medium, you could say. So this would be the case of destructive interference. In fact, perfect destructive interference. You could say that the system is tuned 
so that this frequency of waves <coughs> experiences perfect destructive interference between the reflected wave from the top of the coating and the reflected wave from the bottom of the coating. Now, if it's tuned uh, to have destructive interference for that wavelength, then it's probably not going to work for another wavelength. Does that make sense? You know, if you go back to the formula, if it's satisfied for one value of lambda, it won't be satisfied for a neighboring value of lambda. So what happens if we change the source frequency? Give it a moment and watch these waves now. Aha, clearly there's reflection and transmission. What about a frequency somewhere in the middle? I'm still saying reflections. Let's try a different color scheme. So I can clear the waves and start over. This will make it easier to see that there is reflection at the coating. All right, but if I go back to somewhere in the vicinity of the original frequency and start over, we'll see less reflection. Still a little bit because I, I don't remember exactly where the slider was, but you get the picture. That suggests that one coating is only going to achieve destructive interference for perhaps one wavelength within the visible spectrum. If you tune it so that blue light is canceled, then you're not canceling the red light. So if you're hoping to cancel the reflection of as many colors as possible, what's your best bet? Wouldn't you go with perfect destructive interference? I'm looking for my laser pointer. Your safest bet would be choose the, the material of the coating, in other words, choose N, and choose the thickness D so that green light perhaps experiences uh, maximum destructive interference because that means that the wavelengths near green would still experience a significant degree of destructive interference. Same goes for yellow. I mean, you've only got it perfectly tuned for one color, but all the colors nearby perhaps would also interfere destructively to an extent. And if that were true, if you tuned the coating, so to speak, to cancel green the best, then all of these colors will still be canceled to some extent. And the only colors significantly reflecting from the lens would be at the ends of the spectrum, red and purple. And that's why, as your book points out, binoculars, for instance, a lot of optical uh, instruments, lenses, have that purplish or reddish hue. Now this lens over here evidently <coughs> uh, was tuned the opposite way. Maybe this lens was made to preferentially not reflect purple or not reflect red. And as a result, the coating will reflect constructively green light. It's worth checking out one more thin film interference simulation here. We have medium one with index of refraction N1. Medium two, this would be the coating. You can see it's thin. Index of refraction N2. And then the third medium with index of refraction N3. Now at the moment, I haven't turned on any light source. I have not checked any of these boxes. But what they're showing us here is what would happen if red light were incident upon the coating. So here's the incoming wave, the incident wave. You can see that it's incident normally. That's the case that we've been talking about. Here's the first reflected wave coming off the top of the coating and then the second reflected wave. So this picture is a little different. Um, they're showing the three waves as if they're separate entities, but remember both of these reflected rays or waves, I should say, both reflected waves come from this incident wave. So I'm going to mess with the film thickness. You could also tinker with the indices of refraction, but I won't do that at the moment. Now, what I will do is point out that this is the situation examined in your book. N1 is less than N2 is less than, <coughs> excuse me, N3. So let me adjust the film thickness so that I get, mm, maximum destructive interference for red light. And that would be here, where the valleys of the first reflected wave match up with the peaks of the second reflected wave. So you could say that the overall phase difference between these two waves is pi or three pi or five pi, et cetera. 
Okay, now let me actually turn on a light source like red light and I'll hit play. <clears throat> what are they telling us? RGB, that's red, green, blue. Well, they're telling us that all of the incident light is red. That of course is because I've only checked the box labeled red. And of the reflected light, there's no green and there's no blue, of course, because we're not shining or we're not illuminating this surface with green or blue light, but there's also no red light. All of the red light is transmitted. And of course the net transmitted light is also red. Okay, so I, I successfully uh, tweaked the thickness of the coating to achieve perfect destructive interference for red. Destructive interference on the reflected side. So what do you expect to happen if I now change the film thickness? You know what, before we do that, <clears throat> let's try illuminating the surface with red and green light. Since we've satisfied the, the formula for lambda capital D, that is destructive wavelengths, then that formula won't be satisfied for green light. And let's see, can they, can they show us the green? Yes. See how these peaks are not lined up perfectly with the valleys of the other one. So the phase difference between the two reflected green waves is not pi or three pi. It's also not zero, two pi or four pi. It's somewhere in the middle. And that's why we get some reflected green light and some transmitted green light. Can we show them both at the same time? No, we have to go with one or the other. What about blue light? It looks like the same is true for blue light. Um, when you configure the thickness of the coating so that you get perfect destructive interference for red light, then you get neither maximum constructive or maximum destructive interference for blue light. It's something in the middle. Some of the blue light is reflected. Some of it is transmitted. Let's just do one more. How about I now adjust the film thickness so that I get... Um, perfect destructive interference for blue. Okay, so I've now configured it so that the phase difference between the two reflected blue waves is pi or three pi, et cetera. I'll turn on the blue light. Yep, none of it is reflected. All of it is transmitted. What would we expect to see for red light? Partial transmission, partial reflection? Yeah. Something else we should look at. <coughs> Pardon me, post-COVID cough, still there. Uh, let's see if we can find multiple thicknesses that work for blue light. Blue light is the shortest one. Yeah, so if you think back to the formula for lambda sub, uh, sub D, you know, the, the possible wavelengths for which you get perfect destructive interference. Let's turn that formula inside out and solve it for D. That formula would have uh, multiple solutions for D because M, can take on multiple integer values. So I'm gonna start at the very thinnest possible coding and work my way up and find, I'll see if I can count how many values of M give wavelengths, or excuse me, give how many values of M give thicknesses D uh, within the range. Yeah, they're only give us, giving us a range to work with of 656 nanometers. So that's the thickest that the coding can be, okay. Well, right there, uh, that would be a particular value of M. And this would give another one. That's two already, three, four. Uh, it looks like that's all we can do. <clears throat> so if you go back to that formula for lambda sub D and solve it for lowercase d, the required thickness of the coding, evidently there are four integer values of M that give you thicknesses within this range. Now you could keep going and probably get larger and larger values of the thickness, but maybe you've got some design constraints like the, the coating can only be so thick, all right? And the graphics are so great and the phenomenon of thin film interference is explained so well, I think I'll just let this video play through the end here with occasional interruptions. When I was working on my high-speed photography setup a while back, I started messing with soap bubbles and films. I was trying to make a system to detect the exact moment a bubble pops for a high-speed photography project, and it actually worked. But along the way, I became entranced by the surprising beauty of these soap bubbles. <laughs> 
to me, they kind of look like a vibrant gas giant planet. And I was so excited about this that I posted it to Reddit. But why do soap bubbles appear the way they do? And how come this part of the bubble is completely transparent and doesn't seem to show any reflections at all? Well, we can answer these questions, but first we need to talk a bit about thin film interference. When light strikes the film of a soap bubble, some of that light is reflected off the surface, while the rest is transmitted through the film. Likewise, when the transmitted light hits the back side of the soap film, some of it is again reflected while the remainder is transmitted. The light that is reflected passes back through the first interface and is refracted back out along the angle, identical to the first reflection. That's simple enough, but because of the proximity and the coherence of these two rays of light, they can actually interact with one another. The second light wave has to travel a longer distance as compared to the first, and as a result, the two waves may be in or out of phase. However, if they are in phase, there is constructive interference, and that particular color will be enhanced. Thus, whether a certain wavelength or color of light will constructively interfere or not depends in part on the angle of incidence. Here is a glass mask that I had laying around that was once used to make computer chips. On the back side is a very thin film, probably an anti-reflective film, but we'll get back to that. As I rotate it in the light, you can see that the color of the camera sees depends on the angle that is being presented. However, we can also see that the interference will depend on the thickness of the film. To prove this, I created this two-dimensional soap film and hung it vertically. We can clearly see that the color of light being reflected depends on the height of the film. That's because gravity pulls on the fluid in the film, causing it to be thicker at the bottom and thinner at the top. Repeating bands of color appear because the waves will constructively interfere at integer multiples of film thickness. As a result, the thickness of the film can be backtracked and probably look something like this. <clears throat> okay, let me interject here. Uh, for the thickness of the film right here, you get constructive interference for, I guess that looks like purple light, or is that red? That looks purple to me. So if you look at those, if you look back at the formulas for the wavelengths of constructively interfering waves versus destructively, uh, lambda C, one of the lambda C's here would be a purple wavelength, and the other colors would be closer to the formula for lambda D, I suppose. But why do we see white at the top? Well, in that region, the film is so thin that no single color is constructively interfering with itself, and all wavelengths are making it back to the camera somewhat equally. So we see it as white. But something interesting happens as the film thins even further. In this region, the film reflects no visible light at all. The same is true for the bubbles. As the bubble gets larger and larger, we see that the color is changing because, as we learned, the thickness of the film is getting smaller. Just like the 2D film, it goes from orange to white, and then we see regions where it's completely transparent right before it pops. Here's an even better example with the stationary bubble. We can again see banding as a function of height, changing as time as the fluid is pulled from the top of the bubble to the bottom. And then right there, the bubble has become so thin that no reflections are possible. Look closely, you can actually see the reflections disappearing. Shouldn't we just see white? The reason we don't see white is because there's something I forgot to mention earlier. When a light ray bounces off of an interface, that first ray of light will actually be phase shifted by 180 degrees, or half a wavelength, if the index of refraction of the first material is less than the second. Ugh. <sighs> so, when the film is so thin that the extra path length traveled by the second reflection is negligible compared to the wavelength, again, the first reflection will destructively interfere with the second because of the phase shift. <clears throat> so, if you'd like to relate that to our formulas, remember the total, the total phase difference, delta phi, has two contributions. One from the path length difference, I called it delta phi PLD in this video, and then the delta phi sub zero. Well, in this scenario, the delta x is so small that delta phi PLD, the phase shift from the path length difference, is basically zero, and you're only left with the inherent phase difference, and that would be pi, because the, the wave reflected off the top surface is shifted by pi radians, but the wave shifted, or the wave reflected off the bottom surface is not phase shifted by pi, and that's because the, uh, the other side of the, the boundary there is actually air, which has a lower 
index of refraction than the one in which the wave already existed. So phase shift of pi on the top reflection, no phase shift of pi for the bottom reflection. That means delta phi sub zero, the inherent phase difference would be pi. That's destructive interference. So these bald spots, for example, on these bubbles indicate that this portion of the film is probably only about 10 nanometers thick, and it's no wonder they pop shortly after. Likewise, these little black dots are just really thin film rising to the top of heavier, thicker portions of the film that fall. However, I definitely don't understand the dynamics at play here, and perhaps that will have to be saved for another time. These concepts can be applied to practical uses, and most optic systems, for example, have a thin film coating to cancel out certain wavelengths. We also see thin films in nature all of the time. The wings and insects are a great example, but you've probably seen it just on the street on a rainy day. I thought I'd end this video with a few images I took of some soap bubbles, and now equipped with an understanding of the physics, I think they're even more interesting. Not me. You totally ruined it for me with the math. <laughs>